Hello and welcome back to Shadow Tower Abyss. Last time, we explored the illusion area, or the vision area, depending on which translation you are looking at. Data Books translation is vision area, but um, the fan translation calls it the illusion area. As you can see, we're back in the blue light area. I have already taken the liberty of leaving the illusion area. We're in front of the elevator. Last time we got the key from the nemesis, who tells us he was working for the Great Will. Like a lot of bosses, especially the bird boss from the cliff world and a couple of the other bosses. The boss from the Chalkstone area was also lamenting the loss of the Great Will, or God, as it so happens. This goes into a thoroughfare of narrative that we'll probably get into as we conclude the game, as it's somewhat important to understand the game. The game is a bit abrupt with its ending, and without some of the extra knowledge that the art books give us, it's a little bit hard, it's a little bit opaque. Let's be honest. But it's a FromSoft game, so we know what we signed up for. So let us move to the next area to use that key we got. Empower the Amethyst Lift. I have quite a few notes to go over, actually, with regards to some of the main themes of the game, so we'll get to that. This is the Brightly Jewel area, as per the data book. It is the final area of the game, and the brain of the Shadow Tower itself. If you haven't realized by now, the Shadow Tower, despite being an upside down growing space tree that is also a spaceship, it's sentient. So the greatest irony here as we walk is that the god that many of the bosses allude to has never left them, but has been around them the entire time. Having traveled through the abyss, it found its way into the cursed earth. And it is our last area to go over before we finish the game. It is the last thing in our way. This up there is called the Orb. It is the beating heart and the beating brain of the Shadow Tower. Can anyone spell Latria for me? This controls the tower itself. It is the home of the tower's sapience and the tower's will, and it has created so many of the bosses that we've gone through before. It is called the Orb, according to the data book. Our inevitable conflict. This is the fate of the living. You came for your life. We are cursed. Will the end come? An 
and that is Lulufan. We sh we killed her earlier. You gotta be sit quick. She controls the shield around the orb. She is called negative. Rudafan, according to the data book. The data book card should have already gone up, but I was concentrating on the boss fight. She controls the shield around the orb. You can't just go after the orb because you have to kill her first. If you take too long in killing the orb, she will resurrect and she will attack you again. She has about the same HP, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit more. I don't have the data book in front of me, as when you first attacked her. But if you look at her really close, if you're meleeing her, you can see what's going on. She is covered in vines. She is being puppeted and controlled by the Shadow Tower itself. Controlled and resurrected by it. The only other boss that we have seen where that's explicit is the Chalkstone Area Lion. It's not a lion, it's actually a Moldoru. And it has been crowned with vines to make it look like a lion. The, the lion image isn't unintentional by FromSoft. It is the king of the Moldoru, and it has been crowned as such. But the crown is vines, and it is preventing him from hearing. That's the point there. It's actually really sad. The greatest irony is the god that some of the lower floors were searching for, begging to come back, was here and around them the entire time. Upper floors were more sophisticated in their knowledge, but they called it things like the Great Will, or the King Bird said that it was those made by the Master, the Tower, live for him. The Tower is God to every one of these floors. And they are subservient to it, to its will, and are therefore somewhat interested in, in, in exerting their power. But before I get ahead of myself, let's finish the game. We both just wanted to live with all our hearts. Endowed with life, embracing life, the cursed. And that is Shadow Tower Abyss. The tower itself, killed by our protagonist, is allowed to escape. Poor Nabashima. Left alive with such a bad game. Anyway. <laughs> the tower... The tower lets him go. It has no choice. It dies. But this is another another continual trope that FromSoft loves using in their games, that life is a never-ending conflict. Life, it's very kind of Buddhist in a way. Life 
is a constant conflict and that conflict enforces and reinforces and makes sure that you know that you are alive. It confirms life, but life is only conflict. Buddhism is a constant state of pain and change. But for, for FromSoft, it seems that life is constant conflict, and that constant conflict is the curse. This is con this is present in Dark Souls, this is present in Sekiro to an extent, and this is present in Demon Souls, which Demon Souls is heavily influenced by Shadow Tower Abyss. Heavily influenced. Now Toshi Zin, that's his name there. Naoto Shizen is the president of the board of directors of, for FromSoft's arm at Katakawa. Um, is it Katakawa or...? Anyway, their, their parent company. Let me just leave it here, because there is a new game plus. We'll get to that in just a second. It is a constant influence throughout FromSoft's modern output that life is constant conflict and that constant conflict is a curse to some extent because life without that constant conflict just results in the people in uh, the valley of defilement just wandering around without a care in the world because they're not alive and they have no conflict and they have no cares and the tower just wanted to live but the tower was corrupting itself it was a corrupting force on those around it it corrupted that which it created and this game has a lot to say about power and does power make the leader or does the leader make power and it, there are parable upon parable in this game where the leader thinks power is the end all be all and might makes right constantly throughout the tower might makes right that power exerts your leadership or creates your leadership or crowns you in leadership even though this game shows that is not to be the, the case with the with the protagonist sure the protagonist stumbles through the tower killing them all but the, the protagonist doesn't need the spear the spear is more or less a red herring created by Rudufan because Rudufan herself she wanted out of the tower too and we killed her because she thought Maybe if I die, there would be no conflict and I'd, I'd be escaped from the tower, but the tower resurrects her and corrupts her. And when you kill the tower, the tower's heart, the tower's brain, the orb, she is allowed to escape too, but she's not without the remnants of the tower's corrupting influence. That's why her eye does the thing it does in the ending CG. She still carries bits of the tower within her from her experience being corrupted by it. We freed her from it. Don't get me wrong, but she, is st she still carries that scar, emotional, physical, literal, figurative, or, or what have you. So what is power? What is leadership? What does God create? Who are we, this protagonist who was thrown, thrust into the, into the spear to disrupt the lives of these worlds who don't really know that they're part of an upside down growing spaceship? Are we the invading force or are they the invading force? There's, there's a couple of things that are named for diseases and, and plagues in the monster manual about what is infecting the tower. Many pieces of the tower have been created or recreated to fit their image. And it is a great irony that they are looking for God when they haven't realized that they've created their own paradises. At the same time, they're subservient to the great will without realizing that they have power within themselves rather than exerting hard power by, by stabbing a person. 
Um, so what do you guys think? What is this game telling you? What do you think about the nature of power and the nature of leadership and the deification of those who are, who don't have the language or the vocabulary to know any better about what the powerful represent or who the powerful are? It seems that this game shows you that might makes right, that the belief of many of the tower isn't actually correct, that it's a fluke to some extent, that it's it's not the case. Because if any anyone could just stumble in the tower and like use a gun on their greatest champions, are they powerful? Are they worthy of deification like the Spear King was? There's there's lots to talk about with Shadow Tower and I really hope I see you guys in the comment section. Let me save the clear and just talk a little bit about what New Game Plus does. New Game Plus does have, this. it's the same game, but there are incredibly different item placements. It like showers you with powerful weapons from the get. Um, new item placements. I don't think there's new monster placements, but there's a lot more items. This game has 500 items and weapons and you only scratch the surface in new game. All of the really cool weapons are in new game plus and onward. I'll probably stream new game plus on my Twitch channel. So I hope to see you guys there. And I hope to see you guys talking about this game in the comment section. I know there's been a resurgence in old from stuff, soft games or the pre games before in the age of ancients. So, I hope to see all of your your thoughts and theories hanging out in the comment section. Thank you guys very much for joining me for Shadow Tower Abyss. I know there's a lot of things asking for your time these days, and I'm very grateful for you guys spending some of that time with me. Until next time, everybody. Bye-bye.